Hello and welcome to History 391. Today I want to talk a little bit about the role of television in the American war in Vietnam and also the reality of what sadly were American war crimes in Vietnam. Um, so let's talk about television first of all. Um, the reading for today kind of discusses the, the, uh, the commonly held theory or idea that television uh, effectively or Americans exposure to the war on television had a huge uh, demonstrable obvious effect on the outcome of the war and we know for example that Lyndon Baines Johnson and other American politicians certainly felt this way um, and why did they feel this way well there was a sense you know that um, war obviously is a horrific business and a horrible business um, and you know human beings have been writing about war for a very long time um, and their experiences in war and just how difficult it can be and so for Americans especially kind of a post 1950s relatively wealthy America in fact very wealthy America for Americans to be exposed to the reality of war on their televisions um, was a horrible thing and therefore not terribly surprising this would have impacted public support for the war um, We'll get into whether or not that's the case for just a moment, but certainly the kind of it's it's a self-feeding loop to a certain extent that yes, television coverage generated antipathy towards the war and helped generate anti-war sentiment. Um, it also kind of feeds into this public discourse and this general kind of popular response to the war as this entirely negative, um, terrible thing. And in the sense, it's self-fulfilling in that the media loop creates another media loop such that by the time we get to the 1980s, 1990s, as we'll talk about later in the week, um, there's just this assumption, this assumption that the war was wrong and was a great moral wrong and everything else. Now, if you go back and actually look at some of the uh, polling taken at the time in terms of support for the war, right up until the end, um, there was definitely a very large chunk of Americans still supported American action in the war. Um, this despite the fact that certainly in the kind of streets of Washington DC and in major American cities anti-war protesters had most certainly grabbed the imagination. There's also this increasing problematic issue of the generational difference uh, or the apparent generational difference between the protesters and those who supposedly support the war. Now a lot of this kind of makes assumptions that are not necessarily warranted and certainly even the the television impact um, is open to question. My personal opinion is that there's just no question that television coverage impacted American public opinion and you're also thinking about a very different American media landscape where you know Walter Cronkite gets up and he says as we talked about this in class and has been mentioned in videos since then you know when he when he when he goes in front of the nation and he says you know we did the best we could and effectively you know seeds any any concept of american victory in the war this is this has a major impact this has a huge impact you know um um you know anderson cooper um brett bear you know all, all the these major um these major newscasters now don lemon whomever none of them none of them have anything even approaching the impact and the scope that walter cronkite had and the influence the Walter Cronkite had and so I think it is very important to acknowledge the reality of that. While saying that um, we have to be careful um, particularly thinking about how we look at media today in our own um, lifetime. Uh, the media of the 1960s was not some perfect magical impartial being as is sometimes discussed. You see this a lot or oh, the media doesn't do what it used to do. The media is all twisted now etc etc and all the fake news narrative. There's an awful lot of um, nonsense going on there. Certainly there were people in the 1960s, both on the left and the right side of the political spectrum, who were unhappy with media coverage. Um, we also have to remember very genuine practical problems and um, obstacles to the kind of media that you and I are used to. You and I now are completely used to hearing about news within minutes of it breaking. Like the only real delay left um, is the time it takes someone to sit down and write up a quick story about it. Or in fact, if you're watching cable news, really the only break that's left is how long did it take the cameraman who was already, the camera person who was already, you know, in the halls of the Capitol building to run over and, and get the majority speaker, minority speaker, or whoever to make a comment. So you and I are used to this immediacy of news and that's just not happening in the late 1960s and early 1970s. At the very best, you're looking at a handful of days delay in seeing actual footage. So as a result, um, you know, Walter Cronkite does this very important kind of, you know, video magazine op-ed type thing where he was in, um, you know, he was in uh, Hue and he was in Vietnam um, talking about the Tet Offensive and everything else. You know, that doesn't go out 
the night that Cronkite, you know, made it over in Vietnam. He goes over, he does it, they edit it, they cut it together. He comes back to the U.S. and here's a report that I did while I was in Vietnam. So everything is happening at a lag of days or even weeks at a time. And for the media audience in the 1960s, totally normal, totally used to it. What it means functionally, and our reading talks about this a little bit, is that the, the video is being used a little bit differently from the way that you and I might, might automatically assume. It's being used as background a lot. So in the sense, it's not kind of, look at the attack that happened today, and they show footage of it. They will say, there was an attack, or there was such and such, or this many people died, and so on and so on, happened in this part of the country. And while they're talking, they might kind of show background footage of shooting and violence that's happening and everything else. So so what it, what it means is just that the video footage is being used differently. This doesn't mean it's not effective. In fact, you know, for a fact that it was very effective and Americans, um, you know, were exposed to the reality of the war. Now, what was the reality of the war? Um, it could be very, very grim indeed. Any war has, um, well, all war has its horrors. Um, and, you know, World War Two, which has this almost like sanitized uh, depiction in our popular culture um, was anything but, particularly the fighting in the Pacific Theater was brutal. Fighting in Europe was brutal as well. And we know about the beaches of Normandy actually taking many, many lives. But you have American servicemen fighting in the Pacific Ocean, sending back skulls of men who have died fight on the Japanese side, fighting against them. There's a lot of kind of interesting, interesting things going on there. But in addition to that, Vietnam certainly felt um, worse. And Vietnam felt like a particular moral failure. Why did Vietnam feel like that? Well, um, sadly, there were definitely moments for the American military or members of the American military um, let themselves down. Uh, the most famous of this is the My Lai massacre that took place in March of 1968, where um, um, a group of American servicemen led by uh, Lieutenant uh, William Calley uh, came upon the little village of My Lai, um, and they had been they had lost um, they had lost comrades to Viet Cong attacks. The Viet Cong were highly active in the region. The background context of this was that um, American soldiers and Marines and so on were routinely entering into Vietnamese villages and were routinely being rebuffed or stalled or lied to or what have you. Um, and there was a huge challenge in identifying what were seen as collaborators of the Viet Cong versus innocent people. That dichotomy in and of itself was an incredibly complicated one and a very difficult thing to get the hang of because on the macro level down to the micro individual level, where does one draw the line between being an innocent person and a collaborator? And who is collaborating with the Viet Cong because they are passionately um, pro-Viet Cong? And, and which of them are passionate communists? And which of them are just Vietnamese nationalists? And, and which of them are doing it because they're scared of the Viet Cong? And which of them, and the answer to this is many, are just doing whatever they have to do on a day-to-day -day basis to survive and to try and get through this war? And sadly, the American military in some cases became a part of this kind of cycle of destruction and became something to be afraid of. They were often something to be afraid of, um, helicopter fire raining from the skies and troops coming through and searching entire villages and so on. But in the case of My Lai, it was particularly horrifying. The American troops came upon the town and they, um, and they killed everybody. And we still don't know how many people died. Somewhere between 200 and 600 people, um, women, were, women were sexually assaulted. By American troops, and it was covered up. It was covered up by the military. The um, the State Department, or the sorry, the Defense Department, only really finds out about it in '69 after a serviceman from a different branch, from a different group, from a different platoon, basically writes back to DC and says, "I have right to the Pentagon and says I have heard that this happened, and I this is these are the rumors that are going around." And eventually, My Lai, um, not just the horrible act of My Lai, but the cover up of My Lai is exposed. Um, in the end, only um, five men are indicted, and only Cali himself is found guilty. Cali is serviced to, uh, sorry, Cali is sentenced to a life sentence of hard labor. But he, uh, this is later reduced to ten years, and in fact, having been convicted in '71, I think uh, he is um, he is released on parole in '74. And then this is a very it's a complicated thing. Um, the reality is that he had his defenders from various spectrums of the American political um, landscape. Actually, you had people on the right who felt that, you know, he was in a very stressful situation. And although he reacted very poorly, he shouldn't be shouldn't have to pay for this, which I think many South Vietnamese would not agree with. And um, in fact, there were even people on the left and the anti-war movement who were like, Cali is just another casualty of the reality of the brutality 
of American war. And this all cycles back together because you start seeing veterans showing up and participating in protests. Um, one of the most famous is uh, John Kerry, who had been a lieutenant in the Navy, and of course later on would, uh, would run for president and would um, serve as Secretary of State. And, you know, as part of a very long career in public service. And Kerry goes before Congress and, in fact, he joins protests in D.C. at the memorial um, where he's just very clear that, um, effectively, that the war is completely unjustified. And, and this just adds to this cycle of constant kind of feed of media loop. Um, various communist leaders, Chairman Mao had famously made a comment um, that the Americans were soft and couldn't handle a war and everything else. Um, United States is a free society, um, and even in the 1960s when, you know, the Civil Rights Act had only just been signed in, in 64, and the Immigration Act of 65 only just come in, it was still a society certainly where freedom of information for the most part was important, and so it was not, a, regardless, although My Lai was covered up and Nixon bombed Cambodia without telling anybody, there was a broad commitment to the idea of free speech, and so Americans were exposed to the reality of war. And both that exposure and the fact that the reality of it was not what they, what many Americans wanted to believe the United States was engaging in. This is this doesn't just lead to a problem with you know to 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 an end to the war itself or a lack of support for the war, but really is the beginning of what ends up being a very long term process, which is arguably still ongoing, whereby uh, many Americans are questioning the American American roles in the war um, and what uh, and what America is doing internationally. Quick note, as an historian, to add some context, um, as our reading points out, the idea that this was the first unpopular war is kind of nonsensical. There were certainly earlier wars in American history that were, um, that were not popular. And also the idea that Americans supported military action until Vietnam is also pretty flawed. Um, the United States has a long record um, of prevaricating over whether or not to get involved in international military disputes. I mean, you, you need to look no further than World War II for that. So the discussion question for this video, and I strongly encourage you to read the reading for today before you, if you choose to attack this particular question. What role did television coverage play in American popular opinion regarding the Vietnam War? Thanks for watching.